Hello, everyone. I hope you had a great week. Um, I'm going to keep the pulpit over here because it just it makes me feel like I'm, I don't know, like, like that, yeah. So <laughs> we're going to, last week we discussed David and he was, how he was anointed and then he um, killed Goliath. He went on to do many more battles. Um, the people were, he was, became very popular. The people loved him. Saul got jealous because Saul thought he was trying to take over the throne. So David had to go on the run. And that's where we are right now. And I just one minute here. So we're going to be in 1 Samuel 25. And we're just going to go over the scripture from last week. Now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him. And they buried, uh, buried him at his home in Rahab. Re Re Ma. Then David moved down into the desert of Paran. So Samuel was the one that anointed David. So when he died, for sure, David felt a sense of loss and mourning, okay? So as we go on, so David's on the run, and he's looked at as a fugitive. So he's always got to be looking you know, behind his back, you know, like, like, I don't know if you, when you guys were younger, but when I was younger, I used to run away from the bill collectors, <laughs> and you're always like, don't answer the phone, just don't, <laughs> they're coming for you, <laughs> so it gets tiring after a while, so at the same time, he, David had 600 men with him, and they were hungry, Okay, so all that, it just, it builds up and builds up, right? And builds up. As we can see here, life happens. And I just want to explain this for a moment where David is. Not that David didn't believe in the Lord at this point, okay? And the Lord didn't leave him. But David was concentrated on all the bad and all that was going on. That it built up. And all emotions, whether it be um, sadness, anger, it's okay to... To feel those things because the Lord felt those things when Jesus came here he felt those things it is completely fine you can visit the emotion but don't live there because when you live there you're not concentrated on the Lord and when you stop concentrating on the Lord this becomes a dangerous level right here and what happens is cracks open up and this is when Satan can get in there and he can make you all weird and he's just waiting for the perfect time for that perfect push to bring you over the edge okay so we're going to continue reading and see where David where his limit is a certain man in Moan who had property there at Carmel was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats and three thousand sheep. So I did look that up, and that means that you're pretty wealthy. Like that is a lot of meat, so to say. Um, his name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was intelligent and beautiful. So that gives us one 
um, view of who Abigail is. But her husband was surly and mean in his dealings. He was a Calebite. So he was nasty. He was really nasty. And unfortunately, we're going to meet people like that. You know, we love them, but they're nasty. Um, and a Calebite, it's because he was a descendant from Caleb. And Caleb's the one that went with um, Joshua into the promised land. And they were the ones that said, you know, let's take it over. Let's do this. And then they turned around and everybody was gone because <laughs> they were afraid. So, you know, Caleb was a, a believer. I mean, he really trusted the Lord. So I don't know what happened through the generations for this man to be so angry. But anyway... While David was in the wilderness, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. Now, we discussed last week, that means that they were doing a big festival, like our potlucks. You know, we bring food, and we're just having a good time. It's an amazing time. So he sent ten young men and said to them, Go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. Say to him, Long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours. Now I hear that it is a sheep shearing time. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them. And the whole time they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. Ask your own servants, and they will tell you. Therefore, be favorable towards my men. Since we come at a festive time, please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for them. So he's not even saying, send anything. Send us anything. We want a sandwich. Can you please just send a sandwich? That's what he's saying, basically, you know. Whatever you can, even if it's leftover, send them. When David's men arrived, they gave Nabal this message in David's name. Then they waited. Nabal answered David's servants, Who is this David? Who is the son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered for my sharers and give it to a man coming from who knows where? So David's men turned around and went back. When they arrived, they reported every word. Why they did that, I don't know. Maybe they were part of the gossip girls. I don't know. Like to report every word. This was going to tick them off. So David said to his men, each of you strap on your swords. So they did. And David strapped on him his on as well. About 400 men went up with David, while 200 stayed with the supplies. See, and then this is where this becomes dangerous. And for people today, I want to express that this is the reason why fellowship is so important, okay? Because we need an outlet. And we need to be able to trust somebody. God didn't create us to be alone. We can't do this life alone. And not because you're not strong or not because you're not brave or any of those things. It's because that's not how he made us. He made us to be companions, to be love. And so... Even when Jesus came, did he go around in, in military fashion? No, he sat down and he talked and he fellowshiped because that's the, what we're supposed to be doing. So if you don't have that somebody in your life right now, reach out, 
if ever you're feeling really down, you can give somebody a call here or come by and just say, you know, can you pray for me? You know, there's a prayer train. So don't ever feel like you have to get to this, ever. Okay? Because this is not good. So what happened was David didn't pray. He was going to take vengeance on his himself, okay? He was going to go and kill Nabal and his everybody that was with him. And that's how Satan can play with your head. Because it doesn't make sense that David is going to kill Nabal and all of his people that he was just protecting. He protected those people. But his mind is so at that level that he can't function, he can't see. So at this point, Satan pushes him. There's no turning back at this point. No turning back. This is a very scary time because David is going to go and do something that he will regret, okay? Until one of the servants told Abigail, Nabal's wife, David sent messengers from the wilderness to give our master his greetings, but he hurled insults at them. Yet these men were very good to us. They didn't mistreat us, and the whole time we were out in the fields near them, nothing was missing. Night and day, they were a wall around us. The whole time we were herding our sheep near them. Now think it over and see what you can do because disaster is hanging over our master and his whole household. He is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. That tells you something about Abigail, doesn't it? First, she's intelligent, she's beautiful, but a servant went to her. That is unheard of in those times. She's not even a part of the majority at this point in history. So she must have been a strong security, so to say. And, and I figure because she had to live with Nabal in the way his nastiness was, that she learned how to move around and that built character. Okay, so then Abigail acted quickly. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep. I don't know what that means. I get dressed sheep. I think it's maybe it was cooked or slaughtered. slaughtered? Okay. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, where did I go now? Oh. Five sleets of roasted grain, a hundred cakes of raisin, and two hundred cakes of pressed figs, and loaded them on a donkey. Then she told her servants, go on ahead, I'll follow you. But, did she, but she didn't tell her husband. And she didn't tell her husband because she knew how he was going to react. It wasn't because she was trying to be... Um, an evil wife, or she was trying to... No, that wasn't it. So, as she came riding... Oh, wait. I, oh, yeah. As she came riding her donkey into a mountain ravine, there were David and his men descending towards her, and she met them. Could you imagine... 401 men with their anger up to here coming at you with swords. I thought about it last night and I was thinking oh, one person with a sword and I would have been like, two <laughs> gotta go. 
because I would have been, you know, Nabal is, he's a douche anyway. So, you know, kill him. I'm taking my bags and I'm moving on. But that wasn't the way Abigail was. David had just said, it's been useless. All my watching over this fellow's property in the wilderness so that nothing of his was missing. He has paid me back evil for good. May God deal with David, be it ever so severely. If by morning I leave alive one male of all who belong to him. That is so out of character for David. David's been the protector. And now he's going to go kill all these men. When, Abel, when Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and she bowed before David with her face to the ground. Back in those days, if your face was on the ground, it's because you did that for the king. And that's how much respect that she was showing him. She had, she could have had her head chopped off at that moment. But she said, no, I'm willing to do this. She fell at his feet and said, pardon your servant, my Lord, and let me speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. Please pay no attention my lord, to the wicked man, Nabal. He is just like his name. His name means fool or folly. And folly, uh, fool, and folly goes with him. And as for me, your servant, I did not see the men, my lord, that you sent. And now, my lord, as surely as the Lord your God lives, and as you live, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed, and from avenging yourself with your own hands, may your enemies and all who are in intended on harming my Lord be like Nabal. And let his gift, which your servant has brought to my Lord, be given to the men who follow you. Please forgive your servant. Preemption, the Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty from from my lord because you fight the lord's battles and no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live even though someone is pursuing you to take your life the life of my lord will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the enemies he will hurl away as from the pocket of a sling when the Lord has fulfilled for my Lord every good thing he promised concerning me and has appointed him ruler over Israel my Lord will not have one on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or having avenged himself and when the Lord your God has brought my Lord success remember your servant now, I just want to go back for a second. Abigail, she didn't even throw her husband under the bus. She said, you know what? Please, I'm, I'm here. Don't pay no mind to him. I brought you the things that you asked for. And I hope that when you become king, you'll remember me. So she knew the Lord. That's why she had that That kind of love, you know? And I think we portray that as we start to follow God and Jesus. 
but she was born a thousand years before Christ had come. So it was amazing that she was willing to give up her life and say, I take all the blame. What an ama- that, that's an amazing show of love. And she wasn't doing it for Nabal. And uh, she wasn't doing it for David. She was doing it for the Lord because she trusted in the Lord. David said to Abigail, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to meet me. So he knew right away, God sent you to save me. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day, from avenging myself with my own hands. Otherwise, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, who has kept me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, not one male belonging to Nabal would have been left alive by daybreak. That's That would have been very scary. Because we all know when we go into battles alone without God, we usually are not the winners. Because we don't have that backup support. So Abigail came in and she was able to calm him down. And one of, the, one of the ways she did that, when she talked to David, she talked to him softly. If you talk to somebody with aggression or anger, that's what it's going to cause. It's going to cause anger. So even if we're angry at somebody and we need to talk to them, we have to do it softly. Max Licato, I don't know, you guys must know him. His saying is, soft words break bones. Because that's when you can really come to peace, is when you're treating people with respect. Respect is necessary no matter where you go or who you're faced even if it's your enemy, even if they're going to hurt you, respect. Because that's, that's Jesus' way. And we are Christians, so which means we're following Jesus' way. So then, David accepted from her hand what she had brought him and said, Go home in peace. I have heard your words and granted your request. So that was it. That's all it took was a kind word from somebody just to, because when you get to a point of, oh my gosh, everything's, you know, hitting me and hitting me. When somebody, you know, that's when somebody calls and says, how are you doing today? And you know God had sent them for that purpose. And you're like, oh, no, I'm okay. I'm, I'm good. You know, now that I've heard your voice, it's brought me calmness. And of course, if you're not okay, always share that. Never hide it. Somebody comes to you and say, you know, are you okay? And you're not. It's okay not to be okay. Because that's how you're going to be able to release some of that sadness and anger. So when Abigail went to Nabal, he was in the house holding a banquet like that of a king. So he was overloaded with food. He thought he was a king. He was in high spirits and very drunk. So she told him, nothing at all until daybreak. Then in the morning when Nabal was sober, his wife told him all these things. So she didn't hold it back. She told him the truth that she went out, and this is what she did. 
and his heart failed him. Because in those days, women didn't go behind their husbands' backs. That was a death sentence. No matter, that was a death sentence. And 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. See, David just had to let God. When we're upset or we're angry, we have to let God deal with it. And I know that's so hard because we're like, mm, just let me go over there and just smack and it won't make you feel better, trust me. Just let God do what is meant to be done. He has a plan. His plan was made way, way back there when the world was void. He already knew you. He knew the path you were going to take. So, now let me see where I was. So when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Praise be to the Lord who has upheld my cause against Nabal for treating me with contempt. He has kept his servant from doing wrong. He has brought Nabal's wrongdoing down on his own head. God did it. Now, God's not going to kill all the people you don't like. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> but he'll deal with them, okay? He knows how. Then David sent word to Abigail, asking her to become his wife. His servants went to Carmel and said to Abigail, David has sent us to you to take you to become his wife. She bowed down with her face to the ground and said, I am your servant and am ready to serve you and wa wash the feet of my Lord's servant. That's amazing. Because she could have just stayed on her own, right? But she knew that God was on this David. She knew it. Because she said it when she saw him. I know you're going to be king. You were anointed by the Lord. So she knew those things. And I think that It's a beautiful love story. And the reason I say that is because any message that I will ever say on this stage will always be the same. And if that bothers you, then I'm sorry. But David, he's a lot like God, eh? in this story. And the ball, that's me. That's you. And Jesus came and bowed down on his knees and said, I'll take all the blame. Leave them. Do you know how much love that is? He went up against the creator of all things and said, don't touch them. Because God got to a point where he was tired. You know, like, I'm, I'm getting rid of them. This is it. There's too much sin. But Jesus came. <laughs> That's a love story. <laughs> That's our love story. Because even when we leave this world, It'll still be her love story in eternity. So if anything, Jesus loves you. And when you get to the point where you just can't handle it, get down on your knees and pray, and he will send help. I promise you that. Whether it be a person, a song, he will reach you. 
And this brings me to what my next sermon will be on the 25th. We're going to see what Jesus did for us. We're going to go through the challenges that he had to face. Because I think it's important that we do that every once in a while to remember his, the way he suffered. He was afraid. He felt alone. But he did that for us. Because he said, you know what? These are my people. And I love them. And it's not, you know, Satan has a hold on them. But you know what? I'm going to, I've got victory going on. And so these people will be clean in my name. And that's so that we can be with God again. That that separation is gone because of Christ. And that's just an amazing thing. And so on the 25th, we are going to dive into that topic. Um, In the past, I've vomited when talking about it because it was too overwhelming for me. But I preached the sermon a few years ago and I got through it without puking. And so I hope, God, (laughs) I won't throw up that way, okay, Mallory? (laughs) Please show up, okay? I promise, okay? So that's what we're going to do for the next sermon is to understand why we come here and worship, right? We come here to worship the king because he gave his life for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Nobody could ever love you that much. Nobody on this earth, except for my dog, Paco. I'm sure he loves me more than anything in this world. (laughs) So, um, the closing hymn. I just want to say thank you, Lord, for your love. It's a love that we don't even understand. It's an amazing love. I'd like to ask you to be with us this week. Put your hand on us. No. And... Again, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for taking the sin from me. I love you, Lord. Amen. Have you had something to say? Oh, no, you're quiet now.